The Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling Chapter 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meredith Hughes, Cambridge, Massachusetts. The Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling Chapter 6 To My of the Elephants I will remember what I was. I am sick of rope and chain. I will remember my old strength and all my forest affairs. I will not sell my back to man for a bundle of sugar cane. I will go out to my own kind and the wood folk in their lairs. I will go out until the day, until the morning break, out to the wind's untainted kiss, the water's clean caress. I will forget my ankle ring and snap my picket stake. I will revisit my lost loves and playmates masterless. Kala Nag, which means black snake, had served the Indian government in every way that an elephant could serve it for forty-seven years, and as he was fully twenty years old when he was caught, that makes him nearly seventy, a ripe age for an elephant. He remembered pushing, with a big leather pad on his forehead, at a gun stuck deep in mud, and that was before the Afghan War of 1842, and he had not then come to his full strength. His mother, Radha Payari, Radha the darling, who had been caught in the same drive with Kala Nag, told him, before his little milk tusks had dropped out, that elephants who were afraid always got hurt. And Kala Nag knew that that advice was good, for the first time that he saw a shell burst he backed, screaming, into a stand of piled rifles, and the bayonets pricked him in all his softest places. So before he was twenty-five he gave up being afraid, and so he was the best-loved and the best-looked-after elephant in the service of the government of India. He had carried tents, twelve hundred pounds weight of tents, on the march in Upper India. He had been hoisted into a ship at the end of a steam crane, and taken for days across the water, and made to carry a mortar on his back in a strange and rocky country very far from India, and had seen the Emperor Theodore lying dead in Magdala, and had come back again in the steamer entitled, so the soldiers said, to the Abyssinian War Medal. He had seen his fellow elephants die of cold and epilepsy, and starvation and sunstroke up at a place called Ali Masjid, ten years later, and afterwards he had been sent down thousands of miles south to haul and pile big balks of teak in the timber yards at Moulmain. There he had half killed an insubordinate young elephant, who was shirking his fair share of work. After that he was taken off timber hauling, and employed, with a few score other elephants who were trained to the business, in helping to catch wild elephants among the Garrow Hills. Elephants are very strictly preserved by the Indian government. There is one whole department which does nothing else but hunt them, and catch them, and break them in, and send them up and down the country as they are needed for work. Kala Nag stood ten fair feet at the shoulders, and his tusks had been cut off short at five feet, and bound round the ends to prevent them splitting with bands of copper. But he could do more with those stumps than any untrained elephant could do with the real sharpened ones. When, after weeks and weeks of cautious driving of scattered elephants across the hills, the forty or fifty wild monsters were driven into the last stockade, and the big drop-gate made of tree-trunks lashed together, jarred down behind them, Kala Nag, at the word of command, would go into that flaring, trumpeting pandemonium, generally at night, when the flickering of the torches made it difficult to judge distances, and, picking out the biggest and wildest tusker of the mob, would hammer him and hustle him into quiet, while the men on the backs of the other elephants roped and tied the smaller ones. There was nothing in the way of fighting that Kala Nag, the old wise black snake, did not know, for he had stood up more than once in his time to the charge of the wounded tiger, and, curling up his soft trunk to be out of harm's way, had knocked the springing brute sideways in mid-air with a quick sickle-cut of his head that he had invented all by himself had knocked him over, and kneeled upon him with his huge knees till the life went out with a gasp and a howl, and there was only a fluffy striped thing on the ground for Kala Nag to pull by the tail. "'Yes,' said Big Tumai, his driver, the son of Black Tumai, who had taken him to Abyssinia, 
and grandson of Tumai of the Elephants who had seen him caught. "'There is nothing that the black snake fears except me. He has seen three generations of us feed him and groom him, and he will live to see four. "'He's afraid of me also,' said little Tumai, standing up to his full height of four feet, with only one rag upon him. He was ten years old, the eldest son of Big Tumai, and according to custom he would take his father's place on Kala Nag's neck when he grew up, and would handle the heavy iron ankus, the elephant goad, that had been worn smooth by his father and his grandfather and his great-grandfather. He knew what he was talking of, for he had been born under Kala Nag's shadow, had played with the end of his trunk before he could walk, had taken him down to water as soon as he could walk, and Kala Nag would no more have dreamed of disobeying his shrill little orders than he would have dreamed of killing him on that day when Big Tumai carried the little brown baby under Kala Nag's tusks, and told him to salute his master that was to be. "'Yes,' said little Tumai, "'he is afraid of me.' And he took long strides up to Kala Nag, called him a fat old pig, and made him lift up his feet one after the other. "'Hwa!' said little Tumai, "'thou art a big elephant.' and he wagged his fluffy head, quoting his father. "'The government may pay for elephants, but they belong to us mahouts. When thou art old, Kalanag, there will come some rich raja, and he will buy thee from the government, on account of thy size and thy manners, and then thou wilt have nothing to do but to carry gold earrings in thy ears, and a gold howdah on thy back, and a red cloth covered with gold on thy sides, and walk at the head of the processions of the king.' Then I shall sit on thy neck, O Kalanag, with a silver ankus, and men will run before us with golden sticks, crying, Room for the king's elephant! That will be good, Kalanag, but not so good as this hunting in the jungles. Wumph, said Big Tumai, thou art a boy, and as wild as a buffalo calf. This running up and down among the hills is not the best government service. I am getting old, and I do not love wild elephants. Give me brick elephant lines, one to stall each elephant, and big stumps to tie them safely, and flat, broad roads to exercise upon, instead of this come-and-go camping. Aha! The Kownpore barracks were good. There was a bazaar close by, and only three hours' work a day. Little Tumai remembered the Kownpore elephant lines, and said nothing. He very much preferred the camp life and hated those broad, flat roads, with the daily grubbing for grass in the forage reserve, and the long hours when there was nothing to do except watch Kala Nag fidgeting in his pickets. What little Tumai liked was to scramble up bridle paths that only an elephant could take, the dip into the valley below, the glimpses of the wild elephants browsing miles away, the rush of the frightened pig and peacock under Kala Nag's feet, the blinding warm rains when all the hills and valleys smoked, the beautiful misty mornings, when nobody knew where he would camp that night, the steady, cautious drive of the wild elephants, and the mad rush and blaze and hullabaloo of the last night's drive, when the elephants poured into the stockade like boulders in a landslide, found that they could not get out, and flung themselves at the heavy posts, only to be driven back by yells and flaring torches and volleys of blank cartridge. Even a little boy could be of use there, and Tumai was as useful as three boys— he would get his torch and wave it, and yell with the best. But the really good time came when the driving out began, and the ketta, that is, the stockade, looked like a picture of the end of the world, and men had to make signs to one another because they could not hear themselves speak. Then little Tumai would climb up to the top of one of the quivering stockade posts, his sun-bleached brown hair flying loose all over his shoulders, and he looking like a goblin in the torchlight. And as soon as there was a lull, you could hear his high-pitched yells of encouragement to Kala Nag, above the trumpeting and crashing and snapping of ropes, and groans of the tethered elephants. "'Mail, mail, Kala Nag! Go on, go on, black snake! Danto! Give him the tusk! Somalo, Somalo! Careful, careful! Maro, mar! Hit him, hit him! Mind the post! Are, are, hi, yai! Kya, ah, ah! he would shout and the big fight between Kala Nag and the wild elephant would sway to and fro across the Kedah, and the old elephant-catchers would wipe the sweat out of their eyes, and find time to nod to little Tumai, wriggling with joy on the top of the posts. He did more than wriggle. One night he slid down from the post, and slipped in between the elephants, and threw up the loose end of a rope, which had dropped to a driver who was trying to get a purchase on the leg of a kicking young calf. 
Calves always give more trouble than full-grown animals. Kalanag saw him, caught him in his trunk, and handed him up to Big Tumai, who slapped him then and there and put him back on the post. Next morning he gave him a scolding and said, "'Are not good brick elephant lines and a little tent-carrying enough that thou must needs go elephant-catching on thy own account, little worthless? Now those foolish hunters, whose pay is less than my pay, have spoken to Peterson Sahib of the matter.' Little Tumai was frightened. He did not know much of white men, but Peterson Sahib was the greatest white man in the world to him. He was the head of all the Keda operations, the man who caught all the elephants for the government of India, and who knew more about the ways of wild elephants than any living man. "'What—what what will happen?' said Little Tumai. "'Happen? The worst that can happen—' Peterson Sahib is a madman, else why should he go hunting these wild devils? He may even require thee to be an elephant-catcher, to sleep anywhere in these fever-filled jungles, and at last to be trampled to death on the Kedah. It is well that this nonsense ends safely. Next week the catching is over, and we of the plains are sent back to our stations. Then we will march on smooth roads and forget all this hunting. "'But, son, I am angry that thou shouldst meddle in the business that belongs to these dirty Assamese jungle-folk. Kalanag will obey none but me, so I must go with him into the Keda. But he is only a fighting elephant, and he does not help to rope them. So I sit at my ease, as befits a mahout, not a mere hunter. A mahout, I say, and a man who gets a pension at the end of his service. Is the family of Tumai of the Elephants to be trodden underfoot in the dirt of a Keda? Bad one!' "'Wicked one! Worthless son! Go and wash Kalanag, and attend to his ears, and see that there are no thorns in his feet, or else Peterson Sahib will surely catch thee and make thee a wild hunter, a follower of elephant's foot-tracks, a jungle bear. Bah! Shame! Go!' Little Tumai went off without saying a word, but he told Kalanag all his grievances while he was examining his feet. "'No matter,' said Little Tumai, turning up the fringe of Kalanag's huge right ear. They have said my name to Peterson Sahib, and perhaps, and perhaps, and perhaps, who knows? Hi, that is a big thorn that I have pulled out. The next few days were spent in getting the elephants together, in walking the newly caught wild elephants up and down between a couple of tame ones to prevent them giving too much trouble on the downward march to the plains, and in taking stock of the blankets and ropes and things that had been worn out or lost in the forest. Peterson Sahib came in on his clever she-elephant, Pudmini. He had been paying off other camps among the hills, for the season was coming to an end, and there was a native clerk sitting at a table under a tree to pay the drivers their wages. As each man was paid, he went back to his elephant and joined the line that stood ready to start. The catchers and hunters and beaters, the men of the regular Kedah, who stayed in the jungle year in and year out, sat on the backs of the elephants that belonged to Peterson Sahib's permanent force— or leaned against the trees with their guns across their arms, and made fun of the drivers who were going away, and laughed when the newly caught elephants broke the line and ran about. Big Tumai went up to the clerk, with little Tumai behind him, and Machua Appa, the head tracker, said in an undertone to a friend of his, "'There goes one piece of good elephant stuff, at least. "'Tis a pity to send that young jungle-cock to mount in the plains.' Now Peterson Sahib had ears all over him, as a man must have who listens to the most silent of all living things, the wild elephant. He turned where he was lying, all along on Pudmini's back, and said, "'What is that? I did not know of a man among the plains drivers who had wit enough to rope even a dead elephant.' "'This is not a man, but a boy. He went into the Kedah at the last drive, and threw our mouth there the rope, when we were trying to get that young calf with the blotch on his shoulder away from his mother.' Machua Appa pointed at little Tomai, and Peterson Sahib looked, and little Tomai bowed to the earth. "'He throw a rope? He is smaller than a picket-pin!' "'Little one, what is thy name?' said Peterson Sahib. Little Tomai was too frightened to speak, but Kalanag was behind him, and Tomai made a sign with his hand, and the elephant caught him up in his trunk and held him level with Pudbini's forehead, in front of the great Peterson Sahib." Then Little Tumai covered his face with his hands, for he was only a child, and except where elephants were concerned, he was just as bashful as a child could be. "'Oh-ho!' said Peterson Sahib, smiling under his moustache. 
"'And why didst thou teach thy elephant that trick? "'Was it to help thee steal green corn from the roofs of the houses "'when the ears are put out to dry?' "'Not green corn, protector of the poor. "'Melons,' said little Tumai, "'and all the men sitting about broke into a roar of laughter. "'Most of them had taught their elephants that trick when they were boys. "'Little Tumai was hanging eight feet up in the air, "'and he wished very much that he were eight feet underground. "'He is Tumai, my son, Sahib,' said Big Tumai, scowling. "'He is a very bad boy, and he will end in jail, Sahib.' "'Of that I have my doubts,' said Peterson Sahib. "'A boy who can face a full kedah at his age does not end in jails. "'See, little one, here are four annas to spend on sweetmeats "'because thou hast a little head under that great thatch of hair. "'In time thou mayest become a hunter, too.' "'Big Tumai scowled more than ever. "'Remember, though, that kedahs are not good for children to play in,' "'Peterson Sahib went on. "'Must I never go there, Sahib?' "'asked little Tumai, with a big gasp. "'Yes,' Peterson Sahib smiled again. "'When thou hast seen the elephants dance, "'that is the proper time. "'Come to me when thou hast seen the elephants dance, "'and then I will let thee go into all the kedahs.' "'There was another roar of laughter, "'for that is an old joke among elephant catchers, "'and it means just never. "'There are great cleared flat places hidden away in the forest "'that are called elephants' ballrooms.' but even these are only found by accident, and no man has ever seen the elephants dance. When a driver boasts of his skill and bravery, the other drivers say, And when didst thou see the elephants dance? Kalanag put little Tumai down, and he bowed to the earth again, and went away with his father, and gave the silver four anna piece to his mother, who was nursing his baby brother, and they all were put up on Kalanag's back, and the line of grunting, squealing elephants rolled down the hill path to the plains. It was a very lively march on account of the new elephants, who gave trouble at every ford, and needed coaxing or beating every other minute. Big Tumai prodded Kalanag spitefully, for he was very angry. But Little Tumai was too happy to speak. Peterson Sahib had noticed him, and given him money, so he felt as a private soldier would feel if he had been called out of the ranks and praised by his commander-in-chief. "'What did Peterson Sahib mean by the elephant dance?' he said, at last softly to his mother. Big Tumai heard him and grunted, "'That thou shouldst never be one of these hill buffaloes of trackers. That was what he meant. Oh, you in front, what is blocking the way?' An Assamese driver, two or three elephants ahead, turned round angrily, crying, "'Bring up Kalanag, and knock this youngster of mine into good behaviour. Why should Peterson Sahib have chosen me to go down with you donkeys of the rice-field? Lay your beast alongside, Tumai, and let him prod with his tusks.' By all the gods of the hills, these new elephants are possessed, or else they can smell their companions in the jungle. Kalanag hit the new elephant in the ribs, and knocked the wind out of him, as Big Tumai said. We have swept the hills of wild elephants at the last catch. It is only your carelessness in driving. Must I keep order along the whole line? Hear him, said the other driver. We have swept the hills. Ho, ho! You are very wise, you plains people. Any one but a mudhead who never saw the jungle would know that they know that the drives are ended for the season. Therefore all the wild elephants to-night will. But why should I waste wisdom on a river turtle? "'What will they do?' little Tumai called out. "'Oh, hey, little one, art thou there? Well, I will tell thee, for thou hast a cool head. They will dance, and it behooves thy father, who has swept all the hills of all the elephants, to double-chain his pickets to-night.' "'What talk is this?' said Big Tumai. "'For forty years, father and son, we have tended elephants, "'and we have never heard such moonshine about dances.' "'Yes, but a plain man who lives in a hut "'only knows the four walls of his hut. "'Well, leave thy elephants unshackled to-night and see what comes. "'As for their dancing, I have seen the place where— "'Bapri Bap! How many windings has the Dehang River? "'Here's another ford, and we must swim the calves. "'Stop still, you behind there.' and in this way, talking and wrangling and splashing through the rivers, they made their first march to a sort of receiving camp for the new elephants. But they lost their tempers long before they got there. Then the elephants were chained by their hind legs to the big stumps of pickets, and extra ropes were fitted to the new elephants, and the fodder was piled before them, and the hill-drivers went back to Peterson Sahib through the afternoon light, 
telling the plains drivers to be extra careful that night, and laughing when the plains drivers asked the reason. Little Tumai attended to Kalanag's supper, and as evening fell, wandered through the camp, unspeakably happy, in search of a tom-tom. When an Indian child's heart is full, he does not run about and make noise in an irregular fashion. He sits down to a sort of revel all by himself. And Little Tumai had been spoken to by Peterson Sahib. If he had not found what he wanted, I believe he would have been ill. But the sweetmeat seller in the camp lent him a little tom-tom, a drum beaten with the flat of the hand, and he sat down, cross-legged, before Kala Nag, as the stars began to come out, the tom-tom in his lap, and he thumped and he thumped and he thumped, and the more he thought of the great honour that had been done to him, the more he thumped, all alone among the elephant fodder. There was no tune and no words, but the thumping made him happy. The new elephants strained at their ropes, and squealed and trumpeted from time to time, and he could hear his mother in the camp, and he could hear his mother in the camp-hut putting his small brother to sleep with an old, old song about the great god Shiv, who once told all the animals what they should eat. It is a very soothing lullaby, and the first verse says, Shiv, who poured the harvest and made the winds to blow, sitting at the doorways of a day of long ago, gave to each his portion, food and toil and fate, from the king upon the guddy to the beggar at the gate. All things made he, Shiva the preserver, Mahadeo, Mahadeo, he made them all, thorn for the camel, fodder for the kine, and mother's heart for sleepy head, O little son of mine. Little Tumai came in with a joyous tunk a tunk at the end of each verse, till he felt sleepy and stretched himself on the fodder at Kalanag's side. At last the elephants began to lie down one after another, as is their custom, till only Kalanag at the right of the line was left standing up, and he rocked slowly from side to side his ears put forward to listen to the night wind as it blew very softly across the hills. The air was full of all the night noises that, taken together, make one big silence. The click of one bamboo stem against the other, the rustle of something alive in the undergrowth, the scratch and squawk of a half-waked bird, birds are awake in the night much more often than we imagine, and the fall of water ever so far away. Little Tumai slept for some time, and when he waked, it was brilliant moonlight, and Kala Nag was still standing up with his ears cocked. Little Tumai turned, rustling in the fodder, and watched the curve of his big back against half the stars in heaven, and while he watched, he heard, so far away that it sounded no more than a pinhole of noise pricked through the stillness, the hoot-toot of a wild elephant. All the elephants in the line jumped up as if they had been shot, and their grunts at last waked the sleeping mahouts, and they came out and drove the picket pegs with big mallets, and tightened this rope and knotted that till all was quiet. One new elephant had nearly grubbed up his picket, and Big Tumai took off Kala Nag's leg chain and shackled that elephant forefoot to hind foot, but slipped a loop of grass string round Kala Nag's leg and told him to remember that he was tied fast. He knew that he and his father and his grandfather had done the very same thing hundreds of times before. Kalanag did not answer to this order by gurgling, as he usually did. He stood still, looking out across the moonlight, his head a little raised and his ears spread like fans, up to the great folds of the Garrow Hills. "'Tend to him if he grows restless in the night,' said Big Tumai to Little Tumai, and he went into the hut and slept. Little Tumai was just going to sleep, too, when he heard the choir string snap with a little ding— and Kala Nag rolled out of his pickets as slowly and silently as a cloud rolls out of the mouth of a valley. Little Tumai pattered after him, barefooted down the road in the moonlight, calling under his breath, Kala Nag! Kala Nag! Take me with you! Oh, Kala Nag! The elephant turned, without a sound, took three strides back to the boy in the moonlight, put down his trunk, swung him up to his neck, and almost before Little Tumai had settled his knees, slipped into the forest. There was one blast of furious trumpeting from the lines, and then the silence shut down on everything, and Kala Nag began to move. Sometimes a tuft of high grass washed along his sides as a wave washes along the sides of a ship, and sometimes a cluster of wild pepper vines would scrape along his back, or a bamboo would creak where his shoulder touched it. But between those times he moved absolutely without any sound, drifting through the thick garrow forest as though it had been smoke. He was going uphill, 
but though little Toomai watched the stars and the rifts of the trees, he could not tell in what direction. Then Kalanag reached the crest of the ascent, and sopped for a minute, and little Toomai could see the tops of the trees lying all speckled and furry under the moonlight for miles and miles, and the blue-white mist over the river in the hollow. Toomai leaned forward and looked, and he felt that the forest was awake below him, awake and alive and crowded. A big brown fruit-eating bat brushed past his ear. A porcupine's quills rattled in the thicket, and in the darkness between the tree-stems he heard a hog-bear digging hard in the moist, warm earth, and snuffing as it digged. Then the branches closed over his head again, and Kala Nag began to go down into the valley, not quietly this time, but as a runaway gun goes down a steep bank, in one rush. The huge limbs moved as steadily as pistons, eight feet to each stride, and the wrinkled skin of the elbow points rustled. The undergrowth on either side of him ripped with a noise like torn canvas, and the saplings that he heaved away right and left with his shoulders sprang back again and banged him on the flank, and great trails of creepers, all matted together, hung from his tusks as he threw his head from side to side and ploughed out his pathway. Then little Tumai laid himself down close to the great neck, lest a swinging bough should sweep him to the ground, and he wished that he were back in the lines again. The grass began to get squashy, and Kalanag's feet sucked and squelched as he put them down, and the night mist at the bottom of the valley chilled little Tumai. There was a splash and a trample, and the rush of running water, and Kalanag strode through the bed of a river, feeling his way at each step. Above the noise of the water, as it swirled round the elephant's legs, Little Tumai could hear more splashing, and some trumpeting both upstream and down. Great grunts and angry snortings, and all the mist about him seemed to be full of rolling wavy shadows. "'Aye,' he said, half aloud, his teeth chattering. "'The elephant folk are out to-night. It is the dance, then.' Kalanag swashed out of the water, blew his trunk clear, and began another climb. But this time he was not alone, and he had not to make his path." That was made already, six feet wide in front of him, where the bent jungle grass was trying to recover itself and stand up. Many elephants must have gone that way only a few minutes before. Little Tumai looked back, and behind him a great wild tusker, with his little pig's eyes glowing like hot coals, was just lifting himself out of the misty river. Then the trees closed up again, and they went on and up, with trumpetings and crashings and the sound of breaking branches on every side of them. At last Kalanag stood still between two tree-trunks at the very top of the hill. They were part of a circle of trees that grew round an irregular space of some three or four acres, and in all that space, as little Tumai could see, the ground had been trampled down as hard as a brick floor. Some trees grew in the centre of the clearing, but their bark was rubbed away, and the white wood beneath showed all shiny and polished in the patches of moonlight. There were creepers hanging from the upper branches, and the bells of the flowers of the creepers, great waxy white things like convolvuluses, hung down fast asleep, but within the limits of the clearing there was not a single blade of green, nothing but the trampled earth. The moonlight showed it all iron-gray, except where some elephants stood upon it, and their shadows were inky black. Little Tumai looked, holding his breath, with his eyes starting out of his head, and as he looked, more and more and more elephants swung out into the open from between the tree-trunks. Little Tumai could only count up to ten, and he counted again and again on his fingers till he lost count of the tens, and his head began to swim. Outside the clearing he could hear them crashing in the undergrowth as they worked their way up the hillside, but as soon as they were within the circle of tree-trunks they moved like ghosts. There were white-tusked wild males, with fallen leaves and nuts and twigs lying in the wrinkles of their necks and the folds of their ears, fat slow-footed she-elephants with restless little pinky-black calves only three or four feet high, running under their stomachs. Young elephants with their tusks just beginning to show, and very proud of them. Lanky, scraggy old maid elephants, with their hollow, anxious faces, and trunks like rough bark. Savage old bull elephants, scarred from shoulder to flank with great wheels and cuts of bygone fights, and the caked dirt of their solitary mud-baths dripping from their shoulders. And there was one with a broken tusk and the marks of the full stroke, the terrible drawing scrape of a tiger's claws on his side. They were standing head to head, or walking to and fro across the ground in couples, or rocking and swaying all by themselves, 
scores and scores of elephants. Tumai knew that so long as he lay on Kalanag's neck, nothing would happen to him, for even in that rush and scramble of a Kedah drive, a wild elephant does not reach up with his trunk and drag a man off the neck of a tame elephant. And these elephants were not thinking of men that night. Once they started and put their ears forward when they heard the chinking of a leg iron in the forest, but it was Pudmini, Peterson Sahib's pet elephant, her chain snapped short off, grunting, snuffling up the hillside. She must have broken her pickets, and come straight from Peterson Sahib's camp. And little Tumai saw another elephant, one that he did not know, with deep rope galls on his back and breast. He too must have run away from some camp in the hills about. At last there was no sound of any more elephants moving in the forest, and Kalanag rolled out from his station between the trees, and went into the middle of the crowd, clucking and gurgling, and all the elephants began to talk in their own tongue, and to move about. Still lying down, Little Tumai looked down upon scores and scores of broad backs, and wagging ears, and tossing trunks, and little rolling eyes. He heard the click of tusks as they crossed other tusks by accident, and the dry rustle of trunks twined together, and the chafing of enormous sides and shoulders in the crowd, and the incessant flick and hish of the great tails. Then a cloud came over the moon, and he sat in black darkness. But the quiet, steady hustling and pushing and gurgling went on just the same. He knew that there were elephants all round Kalanag, and that there was no chance of backing him out of the assembly. So he set his teeth and shivered. In Akeda at least there was torchlight and shouting, but here he was all alone in the dark, and once a trunk came up and touched him on the knee. Then an elephant trumpeted, and they all took it up for five or ten terrible seconds. The dew from the trees above spattered down like rain on the unseen backs, and a dull booming noise began, not very loud at first, and little Tumai could not tell what it was. But it grew and grew, and Kalanag lifted up one forefoot and then the other, and brought them down on the ground, one two, one two, as steadily as trip hammers. The elephants were stamping all together now, and it sounded like a war drum beaten at the mouth of a cave. The dew fell from the trees till there was no more left to fall, and the booming went on, and the ground rocked and shivered, and little Tumai put his hands up to his ears to shut out the sound. But it was all one gigantic jar that ran through him, this stamp of hundreds of heavy feet on the raw earth. Once or twice he could feel Kalanag and all the others surge forward a few strides, and the thumping would change to the crushing sound of juicy green things being bruised, but in a minute or two the boom of feet on hard earth began again. A tree was creaking and groaning somewhere near him. He put out his arm and felt the bark, but Kalanag moved forward, still tramping, and he could not tell where he was in the clearing. There was no sound from the elephants, except once when two or three little calves squeaked together. Then he heard a thump and a shuffle, and the booming went on. It must have lasted fully two hours, and little Tumai ached in every nerve, but he knew by the smell of the night air that dawn was coming. The morning broke in one sheet of pale yellow behind the green hills, and the booming stopped with the first ray, as though light had been in order. Before little Tumai had gotten the ringing out of his head, before even he had shifted his position, there was not an elephant in sight except Kalanag, Pudmini, and the elephant with the rope galls, and there was neither sign nor rustle nor whisper down the hillsides to show where the others had gone. Little Tumai stared again and again, the clearing, as he remembered it, had grown in the night. More trees stood in the middle of it, but the undergrowth and the jungle grass at the sides had been rolled back. Little Tumai stared once more. Now he understood the trampling. The elephants had stamped out more room, had stamped the thick grass and juicy cane to trash, the trash into slivers, the slivers into tiny fibers, and the fibers into hard earth. Pa said little Tumai, and his eyes were very heavy. Kala Nag, my lord, let us keep by Pudmini and go back to Peterson Sahib's camp, or I shall drop from thy neck. The third elephant watched the two go away, snorted, wheeled round, and took his own path. He may have belonged to some little native king's establishment, fifty or sixty or a hundred miles away. Two hours later, as Peterson Sahib was eating early breakfast, his elephants, who had been double-chained that night, began to trumpet, 
and Pudini, mired to the shoulders, with Kala Nag very footsore, shambled into the camp. Little Tumai's face was grey and pinched, and his hair was full of leaves and drenched with dew. But he tried to salute Peterson Sahib, and cried faintly, "'The dance! The elephant dance! I have seen it, and I die!' As Kala Nag sat down, he slid off his neck in a dead faint. But, since native children have no nerves worth speaking of, in two hours he was lying very contentedly in Peterson Sahib's hammock, with Peterson Sahib's shooting-coat under his head, and a glass of warm milk, a little brandy, with a dash of quinine inside him. And while the old, hairy, scarred hunters of the jungle sat three deep before him, looking at him as though he were a spirit, he told his tale in short words, as a child will, and wound up with, "'Now, if I lie in one word, send men to see, and they will find that the elephant folk have trampled down more room in their dance-room, and they will find ten, and ten, and many times ten tracks leading to that dance-room. They made more room with their feet. I have seen it. Kalanag took me, and I saw. Also Kalanag is very leg-weary.' Little Tumai laid back, and slept all through the long afternoon and into the twilight. And while he slept, Peterson Sahib and Machua Appa followed the track of the two elephants for fifteen miles across the hills. Peterson Sahib had spent eighteen years in catching elephants, and he had only once before found such a dance-place. Machua Appa had no need to look twice at the clearing to see what had been done there, or to scratch with his toe in the packed, rammed earth. "'The child speaks the truth,' said he. "'All this was done last night, and I have counted seventy tracks crossing the river. "'See, Sahib, where Pudmini's leg-iron cut the bark of that tree. "'Yes, she was there, too.' "'They looked at one another, and up and down, "'and they wondered, for the ways of the elephants are beyond the wit of any man, "'black or white, to fathom.' Forty years and five, said Machua Appa, "'have I followed my lord the elephant.' but never have I heard that any child of man had seen what this child has seen. By all the gods of the hills, is it— what can we say? And he shook his head. When they got back to the camp, it was time for the evening meal. Peterson Sahib ate alone in his tent, but he gave orders that the camp should have two sheep and some fowls, as well as a double ration of flour and rice and salt, for he knew that there would be a feast. Big Tumai had come up hot-foot from the camp in the plains to search for his son and his elephant, and now that he had found them, he looked at them as though he were afraid of them both. And there was a feast by the blazing campfires in front of the lines of picketed elephants, and Little Tumai was the hero of it all. And the big brown elephant catchers, the trackers and drivers and ropers, and the men who knew all the secrets of breaking the wildest elephants, passed him from one to the other, and they marked his forehead with blood from the breast of a newly killed jungle cock, to show that he was a forester, initiated and free of all the jungles. And at last, when the flames died down, and the red light of the logs made the elephants look as though they had been dipped in blood too, Machua Appa, the head of all the drivers and all the kettas, Machua Appa, Peterson Sahib's other self, who had never seen a made road in forty years, Machua Appa, who was so great that he had no other name than Machua Appa, leaped to his feet, with little Tumai held in the air above his head, and shouted, "'Listen, my brothers! Listen, too, you, my lords in the lines there! For I, Machua Appa, am speaking. This little one shall no more be called little Tumai, but Tumai of the Elephants, as his great-grandfather was called before him. What never man has seen, he has seen through the long night.' and the favour of the elephant folk and of the gods of the jungles is with him. He shall become a great tracker. He shall become greater than I, even I, Machua Appa. He shall follow the new trail, and the stale trail, and the mixed trail, with a clear eye. He shall take no harm in the Kedda when he runs under their bellies to rope the wild tuskers. And if he slips before the feet of the charging bull-elephant, the bull-elephant shall know who he is, and shall not crush him. Ahai! My lord's in the chains, he whirled up to the line of pickets. Here is the little one that has seen your dances in your hidden places, the sight that never man saw. Give him honor, my lords. Salam Karo, my children. Make your salute to Tumai of the Elephants. Gunga Pershad, aha! Hiraguj, Birchiguj, Kutarguj, aha! Pudmini, thou hast seen him at the dance, and thou too, Kalanag, my pearl among elephants, aha! Together, 
to to my of the elephants barao and at that last wild yell the whole line flung up their trunks till the tips touched their foreheads and broke out into the full salute the crashing trumpet peal that only the viceroy of india hears the salamut of the kedah but it was all for the sake of little tumai who had seen what never man had seen before the dance of the elephants at night and alone in the heart of the garo hills shiv and the grasshopper the song that tumai's mother sang to the baby shiv who poured the harvest and made the winds to blow sitting at the doorways of a day of long ago gave to each his portion food and toil and fate from the king upon the goody to the beggar at the gate all things made he shiva the preserver mahadeo mahadeo he made them all thorn for the camel fodder for the kine and mother's heart for sleepy head o little son of mine wheat he gave to the rich folk millet to the poor broken scraps for holy men that beg from door to door cattle to the tiger carrion to the kite and rags and bones to wicked wolves without the wall at night not he found too lofty none he saw too low parbati beside him watched them come and go taught to cheat her husband turning shiv to jest stole the little grasshopper and hid it in her breast so she tricked him shiva the preserver mahadeo mahadeo turn and see taller the camels heavier the kine but this was least of little things o little son of mine when the dole was ended laughingly she said master of a million mouths is not one unfed laughing shiv made answer all have had their part even he the little one hidden neath thy heart from her breast she plucked it parbati the thief saw the least of little things nod a new grown leaf saw and feared and wondered making prayer to shiv who hath surely given meat to all that live all things made he shiva the preserver mahadeo mahadeo he made all thorn for the camel fodder for the kine and mother's heart for sleepy head o little son of mine end of chapter 6「The Jungle Book」Chapter 7 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meredith Hughes, Cambridge, Massachusetts. The Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling. Chapter 7 Servants of the Queen. You can work it out by fractions, or by simple rule of three, but the way of Tweedledum is not the way of Tweedledee. You can twist it, you can turn it, you can plate it till you drop, but the way of Pilly Winky's not the way of Winky Pop. It had been raining heavily for one whole month, raining on a camp of thirty thousand men and thousands of camels, elephants, horses, bullocks, and mules, all gathered together at a place called Rawalpindi, to be reviewed by the Viceroy of India. He was receiving a visit from the Amir of Afghanistan, a wild king of a very wild country. And the Amir had brought with him, for a bodyguard, eight hundred men and horses who had never seen a camp or a locomotive before in their lives, savage men and savage horses, from somewhere at the back of Central Asia. Every night a mob of these horses would be sure to break their heel-ropes and stampede up and down the camp through the mud in the dark, or the camels would break loose and run about and fall over the ropes of the tents, and you can imagine how pleasant that was for men trying to go to sleep. My tent lay far away from the camel lines, and I thought it was safe, but one night a man popped his head in and shouted, "'Get out! Quick! They're coming! My tent's gone!' I knew who they were, so I put on my boots, and waterproof, and scuttled out into the slush. Little Vixen, my fox-terrier, went out through the other side. And then there was a roaring and a grunting and a bubbling, and I saw the tent cave in as the pole snapped and began to dance about like a mad ghost. A camel had blundered into it, and wet and angry as I was, I could not help laughing. 
Then I ran on, because I did not know how many camels might have got loose, and before long I was out of sight of the camp, ploughing my way through the mud. At last I fell over the tail end of a gun, and by that knew I was somewhere near the artillery lines, where the cannons were stacked at night. As I did not want to plowder about any more in the drizzle in the dark, I put my waterproof over the muzzle of one gun, and made a sort of wigwam with two or three rammers that I found, and lay along the tail of another gun, wondering where Vixen had got to, and where I might be. Just as I was getting ready to go to sleep, I heard a jingle of harness, and a grunt, and a mule passed me shaking his wet ears. He belonged to a screw-gun battery, for I could hear the rattle of the straps and rings and chains and things on his saddle-pad. The screw-guns are the tiny little cannons made in two pieces that are screwed together when the time comes to use them. They are taken up mountains, anywhere that a mule can find a road, and they are very useful for fighting in rocky country. Behind the mule there was a camel, with his big soft feet squelching and slipping in the mud, and his neck bobbing to and fro like a strayed hen's. Luckily I knew enough of beast language—not wild beast language, but camp beast language, of course from the natives to know what he was saying. He must have been the one that flopped into my tent, for he called to the mule, "'What shall I do? Where shall I go? I have fought with a white thing that waved, and it took a stick and hit me on the neck.' That was my broken tent-pole, and I was very glad to know it. "'Shall we run on?' "'Oh, it was you,' said the mule. "'You and your friends that have been disturbing the camp. All right.' You'll be beaten for this in the morning, but I may as well give you something on account now. I heard the harness jingle as the mule backed and caught the camel two kicks in the ribs that rang like a drum. Another time, he said, you'll know better than to run through a mule battery at night, shouting, Thieves and fire! Sit down and keep your silly neck quiet. The camel doubled up camel fashion, like a two-foot rule, and sat down whimpering. There was a regular beat of hoofs in the darkness— and a big troop horse cantered up as steadily as though he were on parade, jumped a gun-tail, and landed close to the mule. "'It's disgraceful,' he said, blowing out his nostrils. "'These camels have racketed through our lines again, third time this week. How's a horse to keep up his condition if he isn't allowed to sleep? Who's here?' "'I'm the breech-piece mule of number two gun of the first screw battery,' said the mule. "'And the other's one of your friends. He's waked me up, too. Who are you?' Number 15, E Troop, Ninth Lancers, Dick Cunliffe's horse. Stand over a little there. Oh, beg your pardon, said the mule. It's dark to see much. Aren't these camels too sickening for anything? I walked out of my lines to get a little peace and quiet here. My lords, said the camel humbly, we dreamed bad dreams in the night, and we were very much afraid. I am only a baggage camel of the 39th Native Infantry. "'and I am not as brave as you are, my lords.' "'Then why didn't you stay and carry baggage for the thirty-ninth Native Infantry, "'instead of running all round the camp?' said the mule. "'They were such very bad dreams,' said the camel. "'I am sorry. "'Listen, what is that? Shall we run on again?' "'Sit down,' said the mule, "'or you'll snap your long stick-legs between the guns.' "'He cocked one ear and listened. "'Bullocks,' he said, "'Gun bullocks. On my word, you and your friends have waked the camp very thoroughly. It takes a good deal of prodding to put up a gun bullock. I heard a chain dragging along the ground, and a yoke of the great sulky white bullocks that drag the heavy siege guns when the elephants won't go any nearer to the firing came shouldering along together. And almost stepping on the chain was another battery mule, calling wildly for Billy. "'That's one of our recruits,' said the old mule to the troop horse. "'He's calling for me. "'Here, youngster, stop squealing. "'The dark never hurt anybody yet.' "'The gun bullocks lay down together "'and began chewing the cud, "'but the young mule huddled close to Billy. "'Things,' he said. "'Fearful and horrible things, Billy. "'They came into our lines while we were asleep. "'Do you think they'll kill us?' "'I've a very great mind to give you a number one kicking,' said Billy.' "'The idea of a fourteen-hand mule with your training "'disgracing the battery before this gentleman.' "'Gently, gently,' said the troop horse. "'Remember, they are always like this to begin with. "'The first time I ever saw a man— "'it was in Australia when I was a three-year-old— "'I ran for half a day, and if I'd seen a camel, "'I should be running still.' 
nearly all our horses for the English cavalry, are brought to India from Australia, and are broken in by the troopers themselves. "'True enough,' said Billy. "'Stop shaking, youngster. The first time they put the full harness with all its chains on my back, I stood on my four legs and kicked every bit of it off. I hadn't learned the real science of kicking then, but the battery said they'd never seen anything like it.' "'But this wasn't harness or anything that jingled,' said the young mule. "'You know, I don't mind that now, Billy. "'It was the things like trees, and they fell up and down the lines and bubbled, "'and my head-rope broke, and I couldn't find my driver, and I couldn't find you, Billy, "'so I ran off with—with these gentlemen.' "'Hm,' said Billy. "'As soon as I heard the camels were loose, I came away on my own account. "'When a battery, a screw-gun mule, calls gun bullocks gentlemen—' He must be very badly shaken up. Who are you fellows on the ground there? The gun bullocks rolled their cuds and answered both together. The seventh yoke of the first gun of the big gun battery. We were asleep when the camels came, but when we were trampled on we got up and walked away. It is better to lie quiet in the mud than to be disturbed on good bedding. We told your friend here that there was nothing to be afraid of, but he knew so much that he thought otherwise. Wah! They went on chewing. "'That comes of being afraid,' said Billy. "'You get laughed at by gun bullocks. "'I hope you like it, young un.' "'The young mule's teeth snapped, "'and I heard him say something about not being afraid "'of any beefy old bullock in the world. "'But the bullocks only clicked their horns together "'and went on chewing. "'Now, don't be angry after you've been afraid. "'That's the worst kind of cowardice,' said the troop horse. "'Anybody can be forgiven for being scared in the night.' I think, if they see things they don't understand. We've broken out of our pickets again and again, four hundred and fifty of us, just because a new recruit got to telling tales of whip-snakes at home in Australia, till we were scared to death of the loose ends of our head-ropes. That's all very well in camp, said Billy. I'm not above stampeding myself, for the fun of the thing, when I haven't been out for a day or two. But what do you do on active service? "'Oh, that's quite another set of new shoes,' said the troop horse. "'Dick Cunliffe's on my back then, and drives his knees into me, "'and all I have to do is to watch where I am putting my feet, "'and to keep my hind legs well under me, and be bridle-wise.' "'What's bridle-wise?' said the young mule. "'By the blue gums of the black blocks,' snorted the troop horse. "'Do you mean to say that you aren't taught to be bridle-wise in your business? "'How can you do anything unless you can spin round at once "'when the rein is pressed on your neck?' It means life or death to your man, and of course that's life or death to you. Get round with your hind legs under you the instant you feel the rein on your neck. If you haven't room to swing round, rear up a little and come round on your hind legs. That's being bridle-wise. We aren't taught that way, said Billy the Mule stiffly. We're taught to obey the man at our head, step off when he says, and step in when he says so. I suppose it comes to the same thing. Now, with all this fine, fancy business and rearing, which must be very bad for your hawks, what do you do? Well, that depends, said the troop horse. Generally, I have to go in among a lot of yelling, hairy men with knives, long, shiny knives, worse than the farrier's knives, and I have to take care that Dick's boot is just touching the next man's boot without crushing it. I can see Dick's lance to the right of my right eye, and I know I'm safe." I shouldn't care to be the man or horse that stood up to Dick and me when we're in a hurry. "'Don't the knives hurt?' said the young mule. "'Well, I got one cut across the chest once, but that wasn't Dick's fault.' "'A lot I should have cared whose fault it was if it hurt,' said the young mule. "'You must,' said the troop horse. "'If you don't trust your man, you may as well run away at once. "'That's what some of our horses do, and I don't blame them. "'As I was saying, it wasn't Dick's fault.' The man was lying on the ground, and I stretched myself not to tread on him, and he slashed up at me. Next time I have to go over a man lying down, I shall step on him, hard. Hm, said Billy. It sounds very foolish. Knives are dirty things at any time. The proper thing to do is to climb up a mountain with a well-balanced saddle, hang on by all four feet and your ears too, and creep and crawl and wiggle along till you come out hundreds of feet above anyone else on a ledge where there's just room enough for your hoofs. Then you stand still and keep quiet. Never ask a man to hold your head, young'un. Keep quiet while the guns are being put together, and then you watch the little poppy shells drop down into the treetops ever so far below. 
"'Don't you ever trip?' said the troop horse. "'They say that when a mule trips you can split a hen's ear,' said Billy. "'Now and again perhaps a badly packed saddle will upset a mule, but it's very seldom. "'I wish I could show you our business. It's beautiful. "'Why, it took me three years to find out what the men were driving at. "'The science of the thing is never to show up against the skyline, "'because if you do you may get fired at. "'Remember that, young'un. Always keep hidden as much as possible, even if you have to go a mile out of your way. I lead the battery when it comes to that sort of climbing. Fired at without the chance of running into the people who are firing? said the troop horse, thinking hard. I couldn't stand that. I should want to charge with Dick. Oh, no, you wouldn't. You know that as soon as the guns are in position, they'll do the charging. That's scientific and neat, but knives, pa! The baggage camel had been bobbing his head to and fro for some time past, anxious to get a word in edgewise. Then I heard him say, as he cleared his throat nervously, I, I, I have fought a little, but not in that climbing way or that running way. No, now you mention it, said Billy, you don't look as though you were made for climbing or running much. Well, how was it, old hay bales? The proper way, said the camel. We all sat down— "'Oh, my crupper and breastplate!' said the troop horse under his breath. "'Sat down!' "'We sat down, a hundred of us,' the camel went on, "'in a big square, and the men piled our kajawas, our packs and saddles, outside the square, "'and they fired over our backs, the men did, on all sides of the square.' "'What sort of men? Any men that came along?' said the troop horse. "'They teach us in riding school to lie down and let our masters fire across us.' "'Dick Cunliffe is the only man I'd trust to do that. "'It tickles my girths, and besides, I can't see you with my head on the ground.' "'What does it matter who fires across you?' said the camel. "'There are plenty of men and plenty of other camels close by, and a great many clouds of smoke. "'I am not frightened, then. I sit still and wait.' "'And yet,' said Billy, "'you dream bad dreams and upset the camp at night. "'Well, well.' Before I'd lie down, not to speak of sitting down, and let a man fire across me, my heels and head would have something to say to each other. Did you ever hear anything so awful as that? There was a long silence, and then one of the gun bullocks lifted up his big head and said, This is very foolish indeed. There is only one way of fighting. Oh, go on, said Billy. Please don't mind me. I suppose you fellows fight standing on your tails? Only one way, said the two together. They must have been twins. This is that way. To put all twenty yoke of us to the big gun as soon as two tails trumpets. Two tails is camp slang for the elephant. What does two tails trumpet for? said the young mule. To show that he is not going any nearer to the smoke on the other side. Two tails is a great coward. Then we tug the big gun all together. Hey ya, hola, he ya, hola. We do not climb like cats nor run like calves. We go across the level plain, twenty yoke of us, till we are unyoked again, and we graze while the big guns talk across the plain to some town with mud walls, and pieces of the wall fall out, and the dust goes up as though many cattle were coming home. "'Oh, and you choose that time for grazing?' said the young mule. "'That time, or any other. Eating is always good. We eat till we are yoked up again, and tug the gun back to where Two Tails is waiting for it. Sometimes there are big guns in the city that speak back, and some of us are killed. And then there is all the more grazing for those that are left.' This is fate. Nothing but fate. None the less, Two Tails is a great coward. That is the proper way to fight. We are brothers from Hapur. Our father was a sacred bull of Shiva. We have spoken. Well, I've certainly learned something tonight, said the troop horse. Do you gentlemen of the screw gun battery feel inclined to eat when you are being fired at with big guns and Two Tails is behind you? "'About as much as we feel inclined to sit down and let men sprawl all over us, "'or run into people with knives. "'I never heard such stuff. 
a mountain ledge, a well-balanced load, a driver you can trust to let you pick your own way, and I'm your mule. But the other things, no, said Billy, with a stamp of his foot. Of course, said the troop horse, every one is not made in the same way, and I can quite see that your family, on your father's side, would fail to understand a great many things. Never you mind my family on my father's side, said Billy angrily, for every mule hates to be reminded that his father was a donkey. My father was a southern gentleman, and he could pull down and bite and kick into rags every horse he came across. Remember that, you big brown Brumby. Brumby means wild horse without any breeding. Imagine the feelings of Ormond if a bus horse called him a cocktail, and you can imagine how an Australian horse felt. I saw the white of his eye glitter in the dark. "'See here, you son of an important Malaga jackass,' he said between his teeth. "'I'd have you know that I'm related on my mother's side to Carbine, winner of the Melbourne Cup, and where I come from we aren't accustomed to being ridden over roughshod by any parrot-mouthed, pig-headed mule in a pop-gun pea-shooter battery. Are you ready?' "'On your hind legs!' squealed Billy. They both reared up facing each other, and I was expecting a furious fight, when a gurgly, rumbly voice called out of the darkness to the right, "'Children!' "'What are you fighting about there? Be quiet!' Both beasts dropped down with a snort of disgust, for neither horse nor mule can bear to listen to an elephant's voice. "'It's two tails,' said the troop horse. "'I can't stand him. A tail at each end isn't fair.' "'My feelings exactly,' said Billy, crowding into the troop horse for company. "'We're very alike in some things.' "'I suppose we've inherited them from our mothers,' said the troop horse. It's not worth quarrelling about. Hi, Two Tails, are you tied up? Yes, said Two Tails, with a laugh all up his trunk. I'm picketed for the night. I've heard what you fellows have been saying. But don't be afraid. I'm not coming over. The bullocks and the camel said half aloud, Afraid of Two Tails, what nonsense! And the bullocks went on, We are sorry that you heard, but it is true. Two Tails, "'Why are you afraid of the guns when they fire?' "'Well,' said Two Tails, rubbing one hind leg against the other, exactly like a little boy saying a poem, "'I don't quite know whether you'd understand.' "'We don't, but we have to pull the guns,' said the bullocks. "'I know it, and I know you are a good deal braver than you think you are. "'But it's different with me. "'My battery, Captain, called me a pachydermatous anachronism the other day.' "'That's another way of fighting, I suppose,' said Billy, who was recovering his spirits. "'You don't know what that means, of course, but I do. "'It means betwixt and between, and that is just where I am. "'I can see inside my head what will happen when a shell bursts, and you bullocks can't.' "'I can,' said the troop horse, at least a little bit. "'I try not to think about it.' "'I can see more than you do, and I do think about it. I know there's a great deal of me to take care of, and I know that nobody knows how to cure me when I'm sick. All they can do is to stop my driver's pay till I get well, and I can't trust my driver. Ah, said the troop horse, that explains it. I can trust Dick. You could put a whole regiment of Dicks on my back without making me feel any better. I know just enough to be uncomfortable, and not enough to go on in spite of it. "'We do not understand,' said the bullocks. "'I know you don't. I'm not talking to you. You don't know what blood is.' "'We do,' said the bullocks. "'It is red stuff that soaks into the ground and smells.' The troop horse gave a kick and a bound and a snort. "'Don't talk of it,' he said. "'I can smell it now, just thinking of it. It makes me want to run, when I haven't Dick on my back.' "'But it's not here,' said the camel and the bullocks. "'Why are you so stupid?' "'It's vile stuff,' said Billy. "'I don't want to run, but I don't want to talk about it.' "'There you are,' said Two Tails, waving his tail to explain. "'Surely. Yes, we have been here all night,' said the bullocks. Two Tails stamped his foot till the iron ring on it jingled. "'Oh, I'm not talking to you. You can't see inside your heads.' "'No, we see out of our four eyes,' said the bullocks. "'We see straight in front of us. "'If I could do that and nothing else, "'you wouldn't be needed to pull the big guns at all. 
if I was like my captain, he can see things inside his head before the firing begins, and he shakes all over, but he knows too much to run away. If I was like him, I could pull the guns. But if I were as wise as all that, I should never be here. I should be a king in the forest, as I used to be, sleeping half the day and bathing when I liked. I haven't had a good bath for a month. That's all very fine, said Billy, but giving a thing a long name doesn't make it any better. Hush, said the troop horse. I think I understand what Two Tails means. He'll understand better in a minute, said Two Tails angrily. Now you just explain to me why you don't like this. He began trumpeting furiously at the top of his trumpet. "'Stop that!' said Billy and the troop horse together, and I could hear them stamp and shiver. An elephant's trumpeting is always nasty, especially on a dark night. "'I shan't stop,' said Two Tails. "'Won't you explain that, please?' "'Hrumph! Rrk! Rrumph! Rrr!' Then he stopped suddenly, and I heard a little whimper in the dark, and I knew that Vixen had found me at last. She knew as well as I did that if there is one thing in the world an elephant is more afraid of than another— it is a little barking dog. So she stopped to bully Two Tails in his pickets, and yapped round his big feet. Two Tails shuffled and squeaked. "'Go away, little dog,' he said. "'Don't snuff at my ankles, or I'll kick you. Good little dog. Nice little doggy, then. Go home, you yelping beast. Oh, why doesn't someone take her away? She'll bite me in a minute.' "'Seems to me,' said Billy the Troop Horse, "'that her friend Two Tails is afraid of most things.' Now, if I had a full meal for every dog I've kicked across the parade ground, I should be as fat as two tails, nearly. I whistled, and Vixen ran up to me, muddy all over, and licked my nose, and told me a long tale about hunting for me all through the camp. I never let her know that I understood beast talk, or she would have taken all sorts of liberties. So I buttoned her into the breast of my overcoat, and two tails shuffled and stamped, and growled to himself. "'Extraordinary! Most extraordinary!' he said. It runs in our family. Now where has that nasty little beast gone to? I heard him feeling about with his trunk. We all seem to be affected in various ways, he went on, blowing his nose. Now, you gentlemen were alarmed, I believe, when I trumpeted? Not alarmed, exactly, said the troop horse. But it made me feel as though I had hornets where my saddle ought to be. Don't begin again. I'm frightened of a little dog. "'and the camel here is frightened by bad dreams in the night. "'It is very lucky for us that we haven't all got to fight in the same way,' said the troop horse. "'What I want to know,' said the young mule, who had been quiet for a long while, "'what I want to know is why we have to fight at all.' "'Because we're told to,' said the troop horse, with a snort of contempt. "'Orders,' said Billy the mule, and his teeth snapped. "'Who come high?' "'It is an order,' said the camel, with a gurgle, and two tails in the bullocks repeated, "'Hook em high!' "'Yes, but who gives the orders?' said the recruit mule. "'The man who walks at your head, or sits on your back, and holds the nose-rope, or twists your tail,' said Billy, and the troop horse and the camel and the bullocks, one after the other. "'But who gives them the orders?' "'Now you want to know too much, young'un,' said Billy, and that is one way of getting kicked. All you have to do is to obey the man at your head and ask no questions. He's quite right, said Two Tails. I can't always obey, because I'm betwixt and between. But Billy's right. Obey the man next to you who gives the order, or you'll stop all the battery, besides getting a thrashing. The gun bullocks got up to go. Morning is coming, they said. We will go back to our lines. It is true that we only see out of our eyes, and we are not very clever. But still, we are the only people tonight who have not been afraid. Good night, you brave people. Nobody answered, and the troop horse said to change the conversation, Where's that little dog? A dog means a man somewhere about. Here I am, yapped Vixen, under the gun tail with my man. You big blundering beast of a camel, you! "'You upset our tent. My man's very angry.' "'Phew!' said the bullocks. "'He must be white.' "'Of course he is,' said Vixen. "'Do you suppose I'm looked after by a black bullock driver?' "'Fwah! Wash! Oh!' said the bullocks. "'Let us get away, quickly.' 
they plunged forward in the mud, and managed somehow to run their yoke on the pole of an ammunition wagon, where it jammed. "'Now you have done it,' said Billy calmly. "'Don't struggle. You're hung up till daylight. What on earth's the matter?' The bullocks went off into the long, hissing snorts that Indian cattle give, and pushed and crowded and slewed and stamped and slipped, and nearly fell down in the mud, grunting savagely. "'You'll break your necks in a minute,' said the troop horse. "'What's the matter with white men? I live with them. "'They eat us. Pull!' said the near bullock. The yoke snapped with a twang, and they lumbered off together. I never knew before what made Indian cattle so scared of Englishmen. We eat beef, a thing that no cattle driver touches, and, of course, the cattle do not like it. May I be flogged with my own pad chains? Who'd have thought of two big lumps like those losing their heads? said Billy. Never mind. I'm going to look at this man. Most of the white men, I know, have things in their pockets, said the troop horse. I'll leave you, then. I can't say I'm over-fond of him myself. Besides, white men who haven't a place to sleep in are more than likely to be thieves, and I've a good deal of government property on my back. Come along, young'un, and we'll go back to our lines. Good night, Australia. See you on parade tomorrow, I suppose. Good night, old hay bales. Try to control your feelings, won't you? Good night, Two Tails. If you pass us on the ground tomorrow, don't trumpet. It spoils our formation." Billy the mule stamped off with the swaggering limp of an old campaigner as the troop horse's head came nuzzling into my breast, and I gave him biscuits, while Vixen, who's a most conceited little dog, told him fibs about the scores of horses that she and I kept. "'I'm coming to the parade tomorrow in my dog-cart,' she said. "'Where will you be?' "'On the left hand of the second squadron. I set the time for all my troop, little lady,' he said politely. "'Now I must go back to Dick. My tail's all muddy.' and he'll have two hours' hard work dressing me for parade. The big parade of all the thirty thousand men was held that afternoon, and Vixen and I had a good place close to the Viceroy and the Emir of Afghanistan, with his high big black hat of astrachan wool, and the great diamond star in the centre. The first part of the review was all sunshine, and the regiments went by in wave upon wave of legs all moving together, and guns all in a line, till our eyes grew dizzy. Then the cavalry came up to the beautiful cavalry canter of Bonnie Dundee, and Vixen cocked her ear where she sat on the dog-cart. The second squadron of the lancers shot by, and there was the troop horse, with his tail like spun silk, his head pulled into his breast, one ear forward and one back, setting the time for all his squadron, his legs going as smoothly as waltz music. Then the big guns came by, and I saw two tails, and two other elephants harnessed in line to a forty-pounder siege-gun, while twenty yoke of oxen walked behind. The seventh pair had a new yoke, and they looked rather stiff and tired. Last came the screw-guns, and Billy the Mule carried himself as though he commanded all the troops, and his harness was oiled and polished till it winked. I give a cheer all by myself for Billy the Mule, but he never looked right or left. The rain began to fall again, and for a while it was too misty to see what the troops were doing. They had made a big half-circle across the plain, and were spreading out into a line. That line grew and grew and grew, till it was three-quarters of a mile long from wing to wing, one solid wall of men, horses, and guns. Then it came on straight toward the Viceroy and the Emir, and as it got nearer the ground began to shake, like the deck of a steamer when the engines are going fast. Unless you have been there, you cannot imagine what a frightening effect the steady come-down of troops has on the spectators, even when they know it is only a review. I looked at the emir. Up till then he had not shown the shadow of a sign of astonishment or anything else, but now his eyes began to get bigger and bigger, and he picked up the reins on his horse's neck and looked behind him. For a minute it seemed as though he was going to draw his sword and slash his way out through the English men and women in the carriages at the back. Then the advance stopped dead, the ground stood still, the whole line saluted, and thirty bands began to play all together. That was the end of the review, and the regiments went off to their camps in the rain, and an infantry band struck up with, The animals went in two by two, hurrah! The animals went in two by two, the elephant and the battery mule, and they all got into the ark, for to get out of the rain. 
Then I heard an old, grizzled, long-haired Central Asian chief, who had come down with the emir, asking questions of a native officer. Now, said he, in what manner was this wonderful thing done? And the officer answered, An order was given, and they obeyed. But are the beasts as wise as the men? said the chief. They obey, as the men do. Mule, horse, elephant, or bullock, he obeys his driver, and the driver his sergeant, and the sergeant his lieutenant, and the lieutenant his captain, and the captain his major, and the major his colonel, and the colonel his brigadier commanding three regiments, and the brigadier the general, who obeys the viceroy, who is the servant of the empress. Thus it is done. Would it were so in Afghanistan, said the chief, for there we obey only our own wills. And for that reason, said the native officer, twirling his moustache, your emir, whom you do not obey, must come here and take orders from our viceroy. Parade Song of the Camp Animals Elephants of the Gun Team We lent to Alexander the strength of Hercules, the wisdom of our foreheads, the cunning of our knees. We bowed our necks to service, they ne'er were loosed again. Make way there, way for the ten-foot teams of the forty-pounder train. Gun Bullocks Those heroes in their harnesses avoid a cannon-ball, and what they know of powder upsets them one and all. Then we come into action, and tug the guns again. Make way there, way for the twenty yoke of the forty-pounder train. Cavalry Horses By the brand on my shoulder, the finest of tunes, is played by the lancers, hussars, and dragoons. And it's sweeter than stables or water to me, the cavalry canter of Bonnie Dundee. Then feed us and break us, and handle and groom, and give us good riders and plenty of room, and launch us in column of squadron and see the way of the war-horse to Bonnie Dundee. Screw-gun mules As me and my companions were scrambling up a hill, the path was lost in rolling stones, but we went forward still. For we can wriggle and climb, my lads, and turn up everywhere. Oh, it's our delight on a mountain height, with a leg or two to spare. Good luck to every sergeant, then, that lets us pick our road. Bad luck to all the driver-men that cannot pack a load. For we can wriggle and climb, my lads, and turn up everywhere. Oh, it's our delight on a mountain height with a leg or two to spare. Commissariat Camels We haven't a camelty tune of our own to help us trollop along. But every neck is a hair trombone, rich a tie is a hair trombone, and this is our marching song. Can't, don't, shan't, won't, pass it along the line. Somebody's pack has slid from his back, wish it were only mine. Somebody's load has tipped off in the road, cheer for a halt and a row. Or yar, grr, ar, somebody's catching it now. All the beasts together. Children of the camp are we, serving each in his degree. Children of the yoke and goad, pack and harness, pad and load. See our line across the plain, like a heel-rope bent again, reaching, writhing, rolling far, sweeping all away to war, while the men that walk beside, dusty, silent, heavy-eyed, cannot tell why we or they march and suffer day by day. Children of the camp are we, serving each in his degree, children of the yoke and goad, pack and harness, pad and load. End of chapter 7 End of The Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling